Welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today we get to speak with Christopher Linger. He is a retired Navy veteran with an MBA. He is a principal at Up, Upplex Multifamily Investments. He and Maricela Soberanes, who you may remember from a previous episode that she was on as a guest, they've both been real estate investors since 2006, transitioning from a personal portfolio to now managing over 1,900 apartments worth collectively over $300 million. As a serial entrepreneur, Chris co-owns a veteran-owned real estate management company, and has joint ventures in self-storage and mobile home parks. He also coaches entrepreneurs and runs a virtual assistant agency to help businesses grow. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks so much for having me, Flavia. Appreciate it. It's great to have you. And I feel like your bio was, I felt like the sham wow guy. Remember those commercials where he'd be like, and wait, there's more, <laughs> and there's more. Because I, I do feel like you you wear a lot of hats. You've had a very varied and diverse journey of, of doing so many different things. Let's just start with, you used to be in the Navy, so you're military, and then you have this MBA. So clearly you did a lot of schooling and study. And then just looking at, you have the virtual assistant agency. So like a VA agency, you are heavy in this, like the apartments, but also mobile home parks, but also self-storage. How did you get here? How do you do it all? The uh... Wow. Yes, you're right. There is a lot of stuff to us and people will often say the same thing. It all flows together. The VA agency came out of our growth in the business and we started out with single family, quadplexes, duplexes, stuff like that. As we moved on and networked with more people, we found opportunities to partner. We grew into some other stuff. I retired from the military uh, which gave us the opportunity to feel more comfortable with the syndication model for apartments, which is where people come in and basically like group buying. They come in and invest in the property, invest in the business plan and the people that are running the, that business plan for the property. With oh. that, it, it was somewhat of a, I'll say that growth and that turn in our careers, but it was based off of the retirement. Being in the military, I didn't want to be in charge of other people's money. We had talked about a syndication, talked about the group buying thing several years before. And so we spent that time studying up, making sure we knew how to do it all correctly and legally. And then when I retired, we started flipping out of our own small portfolio, small units, and moved over to partnerships and the syndication model. This grew into, hey, we met somebody who does mobile homes. Hey, we met somebody who does storage and we partnered with those people early on with our own money before we ever started bringing investors so that we could make sure that everything's in alignment with how we want to present to our investors and the, the type of deals and assets that we want to do. So that's the quick veer around in the growth side of it. The military background for me helps us in all of these processes because we always had mentorship. We always gave mentorship. There's always some sort of a growth within your career. And so we felt like this was the logical next step. We started seeing that we could afford an eight, eight unit. And then it became something, okay, we're going to have to manage something a little bit bigger, move on to something else. And um, this actually going into the larger apartment complexes is less time consuming on the active side than doing a quadplex or an AX and self-managing it because you're consistently getting calls. You're trying to turn units, do maintenance, show apartments, get them leased up. There's just so many other things that people are doing. And it even translates to people starting out with a new business that's not real estate. So You've had to figure out a lot of things along the way because I'd imagine that if the person you are today 
would look back at the person you were when you first got started, there is just a lot of development that you've had to do, a lot of knowledge that you've had to gain. So what was that transition like from real estate single family, right? So that's when you own onesie, twosie properties, right? There's just a house maybe, or maybe a condo. And then you transition from that to multifamily. Why did you do that? What would the benefits be from one to the other? Does someone have to start with single family homes before they can invest in multifamily? Is that kind of like a path? And what would you tell someone about all of that who's just getting started? Appreciate that question. That's a great question because everybody feels like they have to start by buying a home. And that's not the way you have to start. Yes. I was purchasing homes as I moved uh, with the military. Uh, Somebody had once told me, if you own maybe 10 family homes, by the time you retire, with your military retirement, you should be able to live a a decent life. And I uh, have the first couple that you bought, you'll have them more or less paid off and be able to push through and you'll make enough money uh, to live. And they're right. Actually, my wife and I uh, met in 2017 and I retired in 20. She was in the process of purchasing two complexes, four unit buildings worth almost a million dollars. And I was, I had a home in, back in the States, I was stationed overseas at the time. And we, it, it's one of the topics that helped spark our opportunity to start investing together. Talking to somebody who's trying to get it started, I would say you don't have to go that route of buying a single unit or buying a quadplex because you're buying a part-time job when you do that. the There are other options. Uh, we talked about there being three pillars when it comes to real estate investing. There's time, experience, and capital. So if you have capital, in other words, if you have the money to invest, you can invest in a property that you don't have to do anything else as far as the work on the property except provide that capital. And usually it's maybe $50,000, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depends on the opportunity. And it's a great way to start, especially now, because tell me the last time you saw a single family home that you could get into and purchase by yourself for $50,000 or less. Even 100,000 is stretching it for something reasonable nowadays. But add on with the single families and quads that you're gonna spend time doing all those little things like I mentioned earlier, you don't have to do that with a with a, a an investment of capital into a syndication. You get to continue to push forward in your job or your business or with your family. Like, it all depends on where everybody is in their investing career and in their streams of income. Um, for us, we did the single family stuff because that's what we were told. That's what we thought we had to do. That's where we happened to be. As soon as we realized there was an option for the syndication model, that was our focus. And we, I won't say abandon the other, but we transitioned out. And the transition for that was selling off the properties and rolling the equity into something else, another real estate opportunity. We did exit in a, I'll say, a unique manner, I guess I'll say, that we can talk about further if you want. But we often tell people, hey, we still get cash flow from the stuff that we sold, even though we were able to get cash out of it and move into these other opportunities. That's the way that we started, but it's not the way that everybody has to. We put, we started the syndication side. Um, it, it is not an immediate transition. It is not an immediate ability to purchase and be in the active role. So we actually found people that we were interested in partnering with, and we found their deals interesting enough to uh, invest in. And we went into eight deals over the course of nine months with our capital so that we could see what is it that an investor is looking for? What is it that the active person is providing for information? And is there, am I missing anything? Is there, are there questions? Can I still reach out and ask questions and, and get information back? And this helped us to develop our, interact with our investors. I told you earlier about in the military, we always had mentors. We felt like these, these, sponsors that we had invested with were our mentors. We paid for it in the way of an investment. We didn't pay directly cash to them specifically for mentorship, if that makes sense. 
And that's an option for everybody. So that it, even if you think you might want to do this, but you don't know for sure, you can dip your toe in and get an opportunity to see what it's like before you really are committed to having to do that that version. Or maybe you don't even want to do that version. Fully. And I know we can't give you know tax advice on a podcast. Clearly, everyone's situation is unique and different. And you know, don't ever rely on something you hear on TV or a podcast for your own personal tax advice. But I know that you're big on like tax strategies. And I think that's part of how you approach real estate, right? Is also looking at the tax advantages of real estate as an investment class. So tell us a little bit about sort of your viewpoint on how it's beneficial for your tax scenario to be invested in real estate. Absolutely. Um, And we get this question a lot too about taxes. And one of the things I'll say is one of the strategies that we've been able to utilize is what's called a cost segregation. It, when you purchase an investment property, you can deduct or depreciate, I should say, depreciate the improvements on the property over the course of 27 and a half years. And normally the CPA or tax person that does your taxes will just divide, They'll subtract out the value of the land to buy the rest of the property by 27 and a half. And every year they will deduct the same amount of money each year for as long, for up to 27 and a half years. In the case of a cost segregation, we're able to move all of the depreciation from year 15, from year one to year 15. We get to move it all up into year one, at which point you get a large lump sum of depreciation for anything that depreciates in the first 15 years of ownership. Anything that depreciates longer than 15 years, you still get deducted equally over those 27 and a half years. So you'll still get a little bit extra along the way. The great part to this is that if you you have a large tax burden this year and you're able to invest in something that gives you a depreciation with a segregation that gives you a bonus depreciation, you can deduct a larger amount, right? An example would be we had in 2022, you were able to take advantage of 100% of the depreciation that was available on that cost segregation, on that bonus depreciation. We had investors that put in $100,000 and for that year, for 2022, they were able to receive $93,000 of depreciation for the year. Now that if they are unable to use that depreciation, it does carry over like a piggy bank and it carries over every year. The IRS just moves that number for whatever you don't use each year and they just deduct out of that piggy bank. So anytime we provide returns to them, passive returns to them, they can deduct off the amount they received from the piggy bank and thereby they make income without having to pay taxes on it. Now, some people would also say, the bonus depreciation, uh, it takes all 15 years forward, but not everything depreciates in, we'll say, the five years of the holding period. And so the IRS will do what's called recapture. And so they recapture anything that did not depreciate during your holding period. And some people would be like, oh, I hate when that happens because then it's a big n- nightmare and I get it. I get it. It is to some extent. But if you continue to invest, It's not an issue, number one. Number two is that many of us as investors, we are taxed at a 30% or higher tax bracket. And when they do recapture, it is limited. It's wrong, but I've limited to a 25 threshold. Like they only, they'll only come up to 25% of the bracket, I guess I'll say, as if it was a 25% tax bracket when they do the recapture. In that regard, year one, you received a 30, 35, 30, 37%, whatever your tax bracket was for that year, you received a benefit of not paying tax at a 30, 30% tax bracket. In the recapture side, if your income went up over the five years, like the whole plea it did, based off of inflation and your extra work and all the effort that you put in, but if your income went up and you're in an even higher tax bracket, it's limited on the recapture at 25%. And so you got this loan for three to five years or maybe longer against the depreciation side of things that you were able to utilize to decrease at a higher rate than what the IRS is capturing or recapturing. So that's one of the extra. I know I went a little deep into the details on that one. 
And for Maybe anyone too deep for some people. Yeah. For some yeah. people right now, their eyes are like crossed and they're like, I don't even <laughs> understand. Other people are like, yeah, I've heard of this before. And other people are like, oh yeah, I do this. Of course, wherever you are in your sort of tax strategy, and you might still be a W-2 employee and have no real estate. So you're like learning from square one here. But I think the main thing is uh, you need to find the right tax consultant so that when you're getting your taxes done, it's, you know, I don't want to knock do-it-yourselfers who are like, I'm just going to use, you know, some, one of those $70, maybe it's a hundred now softwares where you can just do it yourself. It asks you some questions, you tap your keyboard and you've done your taxes because that works for a lot of people. But once you're owning real estate, there's so many things that can be done, but you have to go to someone who is talented, who knows what they're doing so that you can take advantage of all of the different strategies and different ways you can structure your taxes because the IRS is not going to tell you to do this. It's not, and there's different ways you can do this. So it really is about getting the best advice, but I love that you're putting it out there for people to think about because if you own real estate, investment, real estate rentals, and you've never heard of the term cost segregation from your tax, if you've never even had that conversation, um, then you should bring that up with your tax professional. You should bring it up and say, Hey, I've heard of this. I listened to this podcast with Chris Linger and he's great. He sounds like he knows his stuff. And he brought up cost segregation. Is that something we've been doing? And if not, is that something we should do? And then just see how your CPA or EA or who, whoever you go to for taxes responds. So this is great, Chris. You may have just really helped a lot of people. I appreciate that. And I, like I said, I know I went a little deep and I have a habit of, I like to give all as much as I can on all tracks, because some of us, we just don't know what questions to even ask. We didn't even know that was a topic, right? Or we didn't realize that there was recapture. We thought we were just going to get this bonus money. And so by putting a little deeper uh, information out there, it opens up a whole nother conversation for some people. And we're happy to help help people away in whatever way we can. And you're absolutely right. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a, a, a lawyer. This is from our experience, not professional advice. So always check with people. We did outgrow when we switched to the syndication model and we started getting the K-1s, which is the document you receive for the passive income. We also received that same document in another version for deals that we sponsor and as the active. And our CPA asked us, says, wait, you got to go back. They, they gave us two K-1s. And we said, yeah, we're supposed to. And he, he thought one was a draft and it was a mistake. And we're like, no, one's active income and one is passive income and they are reported separately. And that's when we already had known before that we were pretty sure that we needed to uh, transfer to a, a more experienced CPA. And so we did that for that year uh, once we got that straight now. But it's sometimes you... It, the quality of your answer of the answer is based off of the quality of the question. And if you don't know which questions to ask, you can go down a wrong path for a longer period of time for sure. And somebody just guides you in a, in a way that they know and understand. I did want to say is that there are, sorry, I did no, want to no, say that there are different CPAs that have different and varied knowledge of the tax code. And essentially, let's just say that the tax code is 100% and most CPAs know 25% of the tax code and they're very comfortable in that area. And this is just a, an example. It's not, I'm not saying anything about any particular group or anything, but let's say that they understand 25%. They are very comfortable in there and they will let you take any deductions on your business that fall within that 25%. But when you come to them with something and, you're, and you talk about deducting the real estate and that's not a fair, uh, an area they know and understand. They're going to say, no, we can't do that. That's sketchy. That's, uh, I don't know. You need to find somebody who knows 50% of the tax code. That includes your portion that you're asking about. When, and I'll, I'll touch to being an active real estate investor and running assets, owning assets, even if you own two or three single families, you could potentially qualify for the real estate professional status in the eyes of the IRS. If you go to your CPA and ask them about it, but they don't understand it or know it, they'll just tell you can't because you have a W-2 job. That's not always true. There are criteria that you have to meet 
and you can look it up. You can tell them, no, I'm qualified. Here's all my documentation. I'm ready to go, and we can do this. And our, the, that same CPA that we outgrew had said that to us. He said, you can't do that. You work this year. And this was to my wife uh, in 2020. She qualified as a real estate professional. And because she only worked four months out of the year, she had spent more time doing real estate than she did in her primary job. Ever since then, because I'm retired, real estate's the only thing I do. Now, I'm the person who qualifies for the real estate professional status. And what that does for us is we can take that depreciation that was only meant for passive income as we're working other jobs. Now we can put it to offset our active income, which is where we really benefit because instead of being taxed at a 30, 35, 37% tax bracket, we have paid zero tax the last several years. So we get to keep that money and reinvest it elsewhere. Amazing. And you help, you coach people. You help other people with what they're working on and doing. Tell us a little bit about that because I know you coach entrepreneurs. You've also got the virtual assistant agency. So you're not solely dealing with real estate day in, day out. You've got these other ventures. Absolutely. The, so the virtual assistant agency grew out of the fact that we were growing and scaling our business using virtual assistants. People came to us asking, hey, I can only do one deal a year because it's all I can handle. How are you doing this? Because we did uh, one year, we did six deals in there. And, and they were like, how are you? doing that. So we told them and we sent them to the website that we used and said, you can go find one, just interview and figure out who you want to talk with. About the third or fourth person, we realized, you know what? We have the ability, we have the business background, and we've already solved the problem that most of those people are coming to us asking to solve. So we just grew that out and, and that became a virtual assistant agency where we provide we provide people to basically run the back office, run your social media. They can do your finances, your financial report role. We've got a bunch of people doing different things, whether it's real estate related or regular business. We've got a custom car parts guy, restaurant people. Like it's, it's varied as far as clients on the virtual assistant side. And then the coaching side, we actually teamed up with and, and our business coaches for Grant Cardone. Um, is one of the avenues to come to us. Another one is the virtual assistant agency and the, the Accelerated Biz is the name of that company. We offer real estate as well as business coaching along that lines. And for people who aren't comfortable with delegation, we even offer a package that includes the virtual assistant that we can help teach you and guide you on how to delegate, how to track, how to ensure that you're getting the most bang for your buck in getting that extra assistance. Because let's face it, if you can give up a task, let's say your newsletter, if you can give up that six to eight hours a, a week or a month, excuse me, that's a start, right? Of getting back six hours so you can spend some weekday afternoon or something with your family. The And then you just grow from there. But the, I said the selling point for us in utilizing that was somebody made a comment, I, I want to say it was Jesse Itzler, and he said, if you need to replace yourself to get you out of the business, you don't need one person. More than likely, you'll need two, maybe three people. And if one person can get the job done 70% of the time, then you're only spending 30% on that task, 30% of the time on the task, and it's probably even less than that because all you're doing is reviewing, tweaking, giving a little bit of feedback. Next time they get 75%, right? 80%, 85%. All of a sudden it's off your plate altogether and you don't have to worry about it. So if you can do that for multiple tasks, you get more of your day back to be able to either build your business, spend time with family, or go enjoy an experience or do something different. Another business if you want in your journey. That's amazing advice. I just really love the advice about delegation, but also what it can do for you. Because I think it's really easy to say to someone, delegate more, or get a team or find some help. But when you explain it in a way like if someone can just take five hours a month off your plate, and then you can spend those five hours with your family, I don't know, cooking together and then watch a movie, whatever it is, 
that alone, like what's the value in that? I just, I love it. I think people are going to want to reach out to you. And I don't even know if it's, (laughs) if you're listening and you're thinking like, I want to connect with Chris, it may be for real estate. It may be for virtual assistant services or to learn more about how to delegate. It could be about entrepreneurship. It could be about taxes. Although Chris, you're not a tax (laughs) professional, but you can certainly probably give a good referral to some tax people. So how do people connect with you? Like where can someone reach you? I will say the easiest way to reach us is invest at upplex.com. It's up-plex.com. You're always welcome to go to the website as well. That's probably the easiest route. I believe that we gave you a a website for a, a download if people are interested. It's 10 mistakes that are killing your real estate deals and how to fix them before they kill your profits. And so I think that you'll be able to have that in the comment section as well. And we'll be able to get linked up through there as well. Outstanding. So yes, we will definitely post the URL for that freebie gift. Thank you so much. Um, again, that gift is the top 10 mistakes that are killing your real estate deals and how to fix them before they kill your profits. I think that's a great guide. There's a lot of information in there. And again, yeah, people can reach you at up-plex.com, upplex, U-P-L-E-X.com. And other than upplex.com, I know you have so many things going on. So I love it. I love keeping an eye on what you and your amazing wife, because together you're like this unstoppable duo, what you're up to. I love staying in touch with you. Thanks again, Chris, for being on the show. As always, learned a lot, got motivated, and hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much, Bobby. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was a great opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave a review on iTunes, I promise I will read every single review. If you know someone who makes a full-time living from part-time work, and maybe this is you, please visit lifestylesolopreneur.com to nominate a guest or to nominate yourself. Because remember this, money doesn't buy happiness. But money in the hands of a happy person, there is no greater tool. Today's episode was brought to you by the Get Shift Done program. It's a lifestyle changing online class to help you define your business and lifestyle ambitions and to set goals in a way you've never experienced before. This class will 10x your daily productivity with methods that will blow your mind. And if you use the coupon code podcast, the class tuition is 99% off. Visit GetShiftDone.com to enroll today.